A group of us have been working in bear's ears on a unit in the landscape that we call an archaeo ecosystem. And it's an attempt to do more with bear's ears than just looking at Puebloan sites, but looking at the context of Puebloan sites and in particular the ecosystem characteristics and then focusing on the plants that are there and particularly the plants that are of ethno botanical significance to the five tribal groups that have their heritage in bear's ears. So in looking at this context, we'll be asking the question of whether the subsistence base surrounding archeological sites is intentional to some degree or coincidental. And we are looking at more than just uh, beans, corns and squash. We're looking at the entire array of native plants that are associated with these sites and look at patterns of plant diversity across the landscape uh, with something we call ethnographic species richness uh, or ESR and the occurrence of significant plant population occurrences. And they may be rare plants in the traditional sense or just unusual plants. And then have all of this bear upon the management of bear's ears, no pun intended. Uh, bear's ears is more than artifacts um, and it's more than just talking about boundaries. Uh, it's about what happens to the landscape uh, in the future. So with respect to subsistence, we'll be looking at a hypothesis that asks the question if more complex sites, and we're talking about archeological sites, are associated with higher richness of ethnographic plant species, and then um, develop regional and site-specific databases of those uh, occurrences and then incorporate not only this knowledge, but then traditional ecological knowledge and practices in making suggestions for the future of Bears Ears management. So in our studies, we've looked at 25 sites that we selected from the State Historic Preservation Office database on BLM or Forest Service lands. And we were looking for things that suggested <coughs> different levels of complexity in terms of habitation structures, the presence of agricultural terraces. Uh, some of these were chosen, about 10 of these were chosen at random, another 10 were chosen uh, for specific features that they possessed, and then uh, five were sites that we just came across in doing the field survey, so sort of opportunistic. And so we took teams of archeologists and botanists out there and we had standardized metrics for measuring archeology span and standardized ways of sampling the ecosystem with uh, specific dimensions, site centrum, defining what the edges were, and then of course, vouchering everything. Uh, Arnold uh, was kind enough to look at all of our identifications uh, he is the premier uh, botanist of the region and uh, has his own collections that are very, uh, very, very extensive. So that was great to have him on board. And then we consulted different sources to pin down ethnographic information on each species and looked at, you know, whether the species were used as food or medicine or ceremonial or just general utility. And we then began to look at landscape patterning, which is to regress ESR and other measures uh, as explanatory variables in a model. Uh, and then for management, again, we would like to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge to our recommendations. Um, and that remains to be done. So we visited a wide variety of sites. Some of them are very well known, like House on Fire. Others were very obscure, hard to locate sites, um, but we managed uh, to do that with quite a bit of walking across the landscape. And um, we compiled a list of 117 plant taxa of ethnographic significance. So this is not all taxa, but taxa for which we could find specific references in the literature uh, on their use by certain tribal groups. So the big yellow square is just an, the, to give you some idea that we had this tremendous list of species 
and then looked at their use as food and medicine, ceremony, utility by the five tribal groups. So Navajo, Hopi, Ute Mountain, Ute, Zuni, uh, and Apache. And when we did that, we, we were able to simply look at um, what we called ethnographic breadth. In other words, uh, species with high ethnographic breadth would be used by uh, many tribes for many purposes. And those with low breadth would be few tribes with fewer purposes. And then their occurrence in the archeological record as well. So that's what these lists are. And certain species have very high breadth, uh, as you might suspect, of course, pinyon pine, uh, Roos and Mahonia. Uh, and some of these then are known also archeologically from the Colorado Plateau. So we began to try to merge ethnographic data with archeological data as well. And then we have a similar list. The blue square is our list of species. And then the purple is just a blow up showing the occurrence uh, across our different 25 sites. So this is just an example of the sites across the, uh, as a rows. And we were able then to look at um, the frequency, which is reading a row. In other words, how, how many times it occurred across all the sites in our sample. And then reading a column is the ethnographic species richness of a particular site, the number of taxa per site. And some species are ubiquitous. They have a very high frequency. Uh, you know, they're just part of the regional vegetation, juniper, uh, Pinus edulis, gamble, oak. Uh, and those species aren't particularly discriminatory. I mean, they're, they're just basically everywhere. But then there's a handful of other species which have low frequency and they're more discriminating in terms of their occurrence across sites. And this uh, includes some native kinopods, uh, lyceum, which is known to be you know, a very significant plant to uh, many tribal groups, Shepherdia, uh, Selenum jamesii, uh, Tradescantia. So <clears throat> this is how we began to examine um, what exactly was occurring at every site. So some sites had very high uh, uh, ethnographic species richness, uh, meaning 24 to 26 taxa. Uh, other sites very low, uh, like Elk Ridge, and then sites in between. So we could see then there were site-specific differences. And then the question became, well, is there any relationship to the archeological features? And is there any relationship to how the sampling was done or where the sampling occurred? So, so for example, mm -hmm. there was no significant relationship between the area we sampled the, the, uh, uh, around each archeological site and ethnographic species richness. So in other words, it didn't matter how large our site was, we weren't getting a significant increase in slope. Uh, similarly, there was no relationship to elevation. Uh, no relationship to uh, north-south, to the northing, but a very interesting relationship going from west to east, where there appeared to be a peak uh, ESR in this zone. Um, you can see here between around uh, 602, 500 and to the to the east. So a zone of ethnographic species richness would be important to know uh, in terms of managing the landscape. As I'm showing here. <clears throat> um, but we also used the SHPO database to look at then uh, 265 sites throughout Bears Ears and use this multivariate generalized additive model to predict ESR at sites that we did not visit. And so uh, I can't talk too much about this result because we have a paper now in, in review. 
uh, the final review actually, but a very significant management tool. And one thing that corroborates that previous uh, analysis of our 25 sites, you can see the high ESR or the purple dots, uh, that's running in that central location uh, uh, east to west, uh, basically uh, from Comb Ridge through Cottonwood uh, Canyon. But with more sites, you can actually see it actually trends east-west as well. So maybe that's an east-west trend rather than just strictly a north-south. Uh, but anyways, we know where high ESR is, uh, at least by this predictive modeling. And when you look at individual species, particularly those low frequency species, you find some very interesting relationships with archeological sites. And um, this is one example uh, of Selenium jamesii, which we've been working on for quite a while. Uh, there is a cluster of archeological sites that all have an association with a small population of Selenium jamesii. And you can see in this photograph, these photographs to the left side here, the amazing relationship to a complex archeological site where this plant, just a few of them, are growing at the base of a slick rock waterfall in a small lens of sand that is purchased uh, above the canyon. Um, that's not a natural distribution by any stretch of the imagination. And we find those rather unnatural distributions in this, what we're calling this potato cultural assemblage a group of sites that all had strange potato populations. And um, they're often associated with grinding stones, which you see up to the right. And then the, the photo to the left, I'm sorry, the photo to the right down below is actually within a pit house uh, structure. So uh, this is part of the mystery of Selenium jamesii that we're unraveling um, through a, a variety of analyses and um, uh, there'll be more on that coming out pretty soon. Uh, so we have met with, uh, well, we had Arnold look at our sheets and, and Arnold gave us tremendous background in, in these um, plant occurrences and the significance to at least to his, to his Navajo people. Carlos Baca is a chef also very, very good on the ground uh, knowing where to find certain populations and very interested in them as food. So we, we have accumulated some of that knowledge as well, or recorded it in our reports, but it's very useful <coughs> in the management uh, aspect of bear's ears. Um, what Arnold, one of the things he told us was that of course, every plant out here has a Navajo name and they're all holy and they're all significant. And Carlos uh, felt the same way too, felt that bear's ears was just full of food. Uh, if you really looked uh, at the landscape like, like they do. So this poses a problem in that um, we're supposed to be using tribal co-management uh, for the monument. This was President Trump as well as President Obama. And how do we incorporate this, this view if all species in the landscape are sacred and useful? That presents quite a management problem. So we're looking at our list of species that we found and coming to three groups that could be useful in managing archaeo ecosystems in bear's ears. The first group is from traditional ecological knowledge, something that Arnold was telling us about called lifeway medicines. And this is just a handful of species that were especially important uh, to the people of Bears Ears. And they include Selene and James E.I. and then Apacara, Neo-Mexicana. Uh, <clears throat> habitation indicators from our data, Cleome uh, and Lyceum. And then of course, rare or uncommon species in the landscape um, in the more uh, traditional Western sense. So we think that Bears Ears could look at 
archaeo ecosystems from the standpoint of these three categories of plants and prioritize sites that uh, had these plant occurrences. And they would be prioritized for special man management actions. <clears throat> so um, this proactive site-specific management would, would be you know, to improve overall habitat quality through, of course, weed removal, maintaining local ecological processes, and minimizing human and livestock disturbance but then using, using maybe traditional approaches, which could include wild cultivation of high value plant populations. In other words, <coughs> where uh, indigenous farmers, indigenous uh, uh, plant shaman could actually go in and manipulate plant populations uh, in positive ways that would maintain uh, their uh, occurrences in these high value archaea ecosystems. So I want to acknowledge our uh, field archaeologists and our field botanists, tremendous group, um, GIS people and uh, researchers that helped us pull these data together. And uh, thanks to BLM for funding and support.